Her Excellency Samia Hassan Suluhu, Vice President of the Republic of Tanzania. His Excellency Benjamin William Kapa, former President of the United Republic of Tanzania. His Excellency Olesegu Nobasanjo, former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. His Excellency Tabo Mbeki, former President of the Republic of South Africa. His Excellency Jakaya Kikwete, former President of the United Republic of Tanzania. His Excellency Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, former President of the Federal Republic of Somalia. And His Excellency Heri Rajao Narimam Pianina, former President of the Democratic Republic of Madagascar. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. How are we doing? I am very excited to welcome you all to the sixth Africa Leadership Forum. Can we give this a round of applause, please? This forum has been convened by His Excellency Benjamin Mkapa and organized by the Uongozi Institute. And over the past few years, we have had the honor of discussing a number of topics that affect the African continent. We've discussed transformation, that was year one. In year two, we looked at an integrated Africa. In year three, we asked how can we enable African businesses to transform the African continent? In year four, our focus was peace and security. And year five, we looked at financing Africa's transformation for sustainable development. And this year, we look at resources, a key issue for the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a digital world. How many of you are online on, in one way or, or another? You may not have your platforms with you right now, but for those who do have phones, please do share hashtag ALF2019. In case you need translation, we do have devices. So all you will do is please remember to plug it in, right? And then channel one is English, channel two is French, and channel three is Kiswahili. So we all move together in our conversation. There's an African proverb that tells us, a wise man never goes far from where his corn is roasting. So how can Africa ensure that we are being this wise person? That our resources and the things that matter to this continent are well taken care of. But for what purpose? We go a step further and we say, for positive transformation of the continent. My name is Julie Gishuru. I'm a pan-Africanist and an Afro-optimist. It's an honor to be with you, and I will spend the next few days diving into these discussions with you all. But to kick us off this morning, ladies and gentlemen, to give us welcoming remarks and a keynote address, can we give a very warm and African welcome to His Excellency Benjamin Mkapa. <laughs> How we do it in Africa is... Good morning, everyone. 
May I welcome you all to this sixth African Leadership Forum. The last one was the fifth. It was held in Kigali through the gracious hospitality of the Rwanda Development Corporation and the Presidency of Rwanda. This time we have been honored by the invitation to meet in these premises by the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, His Excellency Dr. John Pombe Joseph Magufuli. A word of applause for him, please. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for deciding to come and attend this conference. As in previous meetings, the discussions after this plenary session will be held under Chatham House rules in order to encourage frank and open dialogue. These conferences seek to bring together politicians, civil society leaders, academics, youth and women leaders, in order to get their views on pressing African problems and how we should go about solving them. Land degradation leading to conflicts between farmers and herders is one. I use the word peasant very deliberately because their style of cultivation and livestock keeping is very ancient indeed. And hence, they claim that the whole national territory is their pasture for agriculture, or that the whole national territory is past, um, pasture land for, for those herders of cattle. And that leads to conflicts of every kind. Related to this is climate change, where the inclination is to see this subject as affecting more drastically the industrialized countries of the developed north and south of our planet. I've decided that we should have in-depth discussion of how these impact upon our own national development. I want to thank the sponsors of this, and here I count among them the African Wildlife Foundation, the Independent Television Tanzania, Tanzania Broadcasting Corporation, and the Diamond Trust Bank Tanzania. I also want to put in a special word of thanks to the government of Finland, which has over these six sessions helped us with financial backbone. So I say thank you to the government of Finland, and please give them my hand. <clears throat> the keynote address was to have been given by Dr. Akinwumi Adesina, the president of the African Development Bank. However, he had committed himself to attendance at the TICAD in Japan, where he is at present. He wishes us faithful discussions. I am, I am a poor standing for Dr. Adesina, but here we go. The topic for this year's African Leadership Forum touches the growth prospects of many African countries, if not all of them and the lives of all their citizens. As the program shows, as the program shows, it has three subtitles, namely conservation, land management, and climate change. Climate change. This is no accident, because the three interface and impact one another. Courage and protection 
of national parks, forests, and wetland reserves. It is perceived as the backbone of tourism, and in the face of a small domestic tourism, it, it is reckoned to cater to foreigners and to have little economic impact on ordinary national citizens. But this is a misperception. Absence of a conservation policy and accompanying programs can have a disastrous impact on the nation's ecosystems and weather prospects. Both can accrue from the nation's land use policy, thus affecting the sustainability of its land management system. To achieve vibrant economic growth, it is necessary to have sustainable land management in place. The United Nations defines sustainable land management as the use of land resources, including soils, water, animals, and plants, for the production of goods to meet changing human needs. It envisages the, adop the, adop the adoption of land use systems that through appropriate management practices enable land users to maximize the economic and social benefits from the land while maintaining or enhancing the ecological support functions of the land resources. Sustainable land management involves a holistic approach to achieving productive and healthy ecosystems by integrating social, economic, physical, and biological needs and values, contributing to sustainable and rural development, the realization of such a land management paradigm calls for involvement and partnership of land users, technical experts, and policy makers in government and political parties. Climate change. <laughs> oh. It's okay now? It's okay now. Oh. <laughs> The destruction and diminution of the ecological and social environment can be attributed to two causes, namely human activities and the, interfer in the interface of nature. Sub-Saharan Africa is endowed with great population, ecological climate, and cultural diversity. The population of Sub-Saharan Africa is set to cross the one billion mark this year. Increased food production in countries where there is a minimum of industrialization, and that is to say, much of Africa, means population pressure on the land. Basic agricultural transformation means wading into forest land and excessive land use. The result is poor land management and agricultural practices, landslides, and over flooding. While we must put more hoes and tractors to the land, it is necessary to bear in mind that the land is finite and so are land related assets. Such human activities, especially those using and producing fossil fuels for industrial production, electricity generation, and motor cars, affect the weather. Gases produced by such activities are building up in the atmosphere, trapping too much of the sun's heat 
and raising the Earth's temperature, a process known as global warming. As the Earth heats up, it, it alters rainfall and other weather and climate conditions. Africa, the poorest and least developed of all the world's regions, will be especially hard pressed to adjust. I dare to suggest that much of the present and planned growth in Africa is not taking enough consideration of the region's human and natural resources base. Increasing demands are placed for land and other natural resources and affecting on nature and wildlife reserves. In this way, development is made to pit people and nature versus wildlife reserves in competition. Under this strategy, land becomes degraded and less productive. Tourism resources become decimated. People are impoverished. The heritage of national and animal history are consigned to electronic archives. Ultimately, both people and wildlife suffer. Africa's natural capital must be preserved and enriched. Poorly planned agricultural settlements, infrastructure development, and resource extraction must not drive the degradation of forests, rivers, and grasslands. For the resulting habitat loss and fragmentation threaten ecosystem goods and services upon which people and wildlife both depend. One sure way of slowing down deforestation is afforestation, planting new trees. There can be a serious and concerted program of planting new trees. A few months ago, volunteers started the Kilimanjaro tree project. They recalled that at Tanganyika's independence, a torch was lit at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro to light the way for the freedom fighters, to light the way for the freedom fighters of colonial Southern Africa and racist minority ruled South Africa. There has been much tree felling around the mountain. Some people say this may explain the reduction of the snows at the top of the mountain. While the tree planting has started in Kilimanjaro, they hope it will extend throughout the country. When I turned 80 last November, believe it or not, Sebastian Koloa University College gave me a birthday card, happy birthday card. You know what it was? It was the planting of 80 trees in my name. In September 2006, the UNFCC Secretariat convened a conference on climate change adaptation attended by 33 African governments and a number of international agencies and civil society groups. The meeting highlighted the need for greater, the need for greater monitoring and early warning of climate changes and severe weather events like droughts and floods and called for integration of long-term adaptation strategies into development and disaster preparedness programs. As Sierra Leonean climate scientist Ogunyade Davidson has observed, and I quote him, Africa never enjoyed the financial benefits generated by putting greenhouse gases up there through the industrial revolution of the developed countries in the first place. It never accumulated the wealth to be able to bear the shocks. So now they have, again quote, to cope with the effects of a situation they did not create with resources they do not have. And global warming is a double loser for countries in Africa. 
Climate change manifests itself and is felt in different ways. It is occasioned by global warming and excessive deposition of renewable natural resources, land fertility, deforestation, and inland waters recession. Tanzania presents a good example. 70% of the population, peasant farmers and livestock herders, rely on climate change and global warming. As the economy and population grows, renewable natural resources are declining. Overharvesting, land degradation, and unsustainable use of renewable natural resources see to the increase in the damage. It is estimated 8,770 square kilometers disappear every year. If this trend continues, by 2075, there will be no forests. By 2075, there will be no forests in Tanzania. In the last 15 years, some 130,000 square kilometers of land has been deforested. The possibility of tree planting is very real because the soils of the country are not yet badly degraded. In Uganda, on the other hand, this country is listed as at risk of losing all its forest because of unsustainable deforestation in 40 years. Forests and woodlands are estimated to cover about 15% of its land surface. Forests provide many economic and environmental benefits. They prevail, they prevent soil erosion and help maintain water resources. Forestry related activities can offer opportunities for jobs and skills, development for youth and women, we can protect natural forests and plant new forests. If we do that, we can create jobs as answer to our growing population. Reforestation is possible. In Kenya, Wangari Mathai's Green Belt Movement planted over 50 million trees around Nairobi in about 10 years. Ethiopia has since May this year planted 2.6 billion trees as part of a campaign to fight desertification. The target for Ethiopia is to plant 4 billion trees by the second half of this year, averaging of all 40 trees per each of Ethiopia's 100 million people. At the recently concluded 39th summit of the SADC, held here in Dar es Salaam two weeks ago. The outgoing chairman, President Harge Gengob of Namibia, pointed out the immense damage which was caused by weather changes in the region this year alone. And I quote him, climate change is real and our region can attest to this fact. Between January and April 2019, the region faced several weather-related phenomena, namely tropical cyclone Desmond, Enawo, Idai, and Kenneth. As a result of these events, we witnessed extensive flooding in Comoros, Mozambique, Tanzania, Madagascar, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Heavy rains also affected KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. He went on. The cyclones killed over 1,000 people, injured an estimated 3,000 people, damaged economic infrastructure, education and health facilities, and destroyed over 800,000 hectares of cropland, as well as crops and seed shocks. Over 3.3 million people were affected and required immediate humanitarian assistance, including food, shelter, clothing, portable water, sanitation, and medical support. 
In addition, he went on, below average rainfall and prolonged dry spell resulted in reduced agricultural production, thus negatively affecting pasture and livestock, as well as water supply for human and other users. Member states affected by severe drought And three, post-disaster needs assessment was conducted in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe for reconstruction and rebuilding following the tropical cyclone Idai. He concluded UN agencies and other partner institutions, civil society organizations, the private sector, and individuals supported the affected member states during these challenging of the national and regional humanitarian appeals, a total of US dollars 4.3 million, translating to 41% of the required 491 million has been mobilized. Record low temperatures in temperate and cold parts of the world in the northern and southern hemispheres have been accompanied by frequent natural disasters. On our continent, we have seen typhoons and floods on unprecedented scales. With electronic, me electronic media, we have witnessed rains and winds decapitate towns and hamlets, displace populations, destroy food crops in flooded farms, and take lives of hundreds of people. A writer in the journal Science states that planting billions of trees across the world is by far the cheapest and most efficient way to tackle climate change. As trees grow, they absorb and store the, they, they absorb and store the carbon dioxide emissions that are di driving global heating. New research estimates that worldwide tree planting programs could remove two thirds of all the emissions that have been pumped into the atmosphere by human activities, a mind-blowing figure, according to the, to the scientist. The July Analytical Review in Science calculated how many additional trees could be planted globally without, encouraging, without encroaching on cropland or urban areas. It found that there are 1.7 billion hectares of treeless land on which 1.2 trillion native trees, saplings, would naturally grow. Using the most efficient methods, one trillion trees could be restored for as little as $300 billion. The chief drawback, of course, of this re 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 reforestation as a solution to the climate crisis is that trees grow slowly hence a projection of 50 to 100 years to reach full carbon sequestering potential. All this appears to fall too, 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 appears too tall an order, but there is no alternative. We must arouse an inflated interest by government, the general public, and environmental activists on the worsening climate impacts and remedial measures. Biodiversity has a galvanizing effect on human health and well-being. Last May 20th, observing International Day for Biodiversity, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, observed that the quality of water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe, 
all depend on keeping the natural world healthy. He underlined that biodiversity and protection of ecosystems are, are essential to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and to address climate change. Mr. Guterres urged all governments, business, and civil society to, and I quote him, take urgent action to protect and sustainably manage the fragile and vital web of life on, on our one and only planet, end of quote. The UN Secretary General has called a special climate summit to be held in New York this coming September 23rd. This will be followed by COP25 in Santiago, Chile, and COP26 in the UK. The UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea will meet to negotiate a new Global Ocean Treaty next year. It may be possible to reach an agreement emphasizing sustainable farming and fishing on the one hand, and a limit to deforestation on the other. Africa must be represented at these gatherings. What am I advocating? I am advocating the proclamation of renewal of our commitment to preserve national parks, nature reserves, and wildlands as a national and world heritage. They can contribute to national income and job creation. Encroachment should not be entertained or accommodated, but also flora and fauna are important factors to realizing national development operations. Communities must be incorporated in the programs for sustainable management of forests and carbon credits therefrom should devolve to their benefit. The UN program for deforestation and forest degradation should devolve incentives to them for adaptation to land use in financial terms. Government and communities must collaborate always in the introduction of climate sensitive agriculture and sustainable energy solutions. Communities must be sensitized and empowered to secure their water resources. Water user associations must be encouraged, so also must be rainwater harvesting. The population must be conscientized to the reality that development is not someone else's concern. That is the meaning of self-reliance and self-development. African countries should put in place, by policy and practice, a land use policy. This should spell out with a minimum of equivocation, rights of occupancy, and an adjudication system of resolution of land disputes. There should spell out, these, these should spell out clear guidelines and procedures for determination and enforcement. Simultaneously, they should adopt an ecosystem based, an eco based, an ecosystem -based adaptation for rural resilience. There should be continuing public and citizen education on the imperative of respecting and protecting designated national forests, national parks, and national wildlife and wildlands. The citizens must be made to appreciate the true social, economic, biological, and scientific importance of wetlands and assisted to change from a harvesting to a management approach. The citizenry must be oriented towards the search for alternative clean fuel use, just as governments consider and promote wind and solar energy. Countries must embark on programs of reforestation and educate the populace on the importance of reversing land degradation and renewing degraded ecosystems. There must be de devised a national biodiversity and action plan. 
Allow me to say a word about the African Wildlife Foundation, of which I am vice chairman of the board. Nearly 60 years old, it is one of Africa's largest and oldest NGO. It believes first and foremost in a future where human development includes thriving wildlife and extensive wild lands as cultural and economic assets for Africa's future generations. A recent landmark UN report revealed that one million species are at risk of extinction with alarming implications for human survival, yet we have the tools and knowledge to respond. Now more than ever, public and private interventions are needed. Our top priorities are to reduce poaching and human wildlife conflict, to tackle the illegal wildlife trade, to protect wildlife in its natural habitat and restore ecosystems, and to support Africans to prioritize wildlife and wildlands as essential to development. As our saying goes, when we protect wild animals and wild lands, we protect Africa's future. Ladies and gentlemen, the world today is characterized by rapidly advancing disorientation and dysfunction. Big power alliances are coming apart. Small power integration is proceeding at snail's pace. International cooperation is less professed and may stand out not in profession but in malpractice. Development aid is increasingly questioned because it is seen as a dirty word. Africa is seen much more as a source of minerals and its migrants are not only resented in Europe but are left to die as they strive to cross the Mediterranean. In such a chaotic world environment, Africa must review its development perspective and strengthen its capacity for self-reliance. Let me conclude with a story. This is not the first time I tell this, but it may be the first time to you. A surgeon, a field marshal, and a politician had had a very liquid lunch together and we are now in deep argument. Quote, a surgeon's job is the oldest profession in the world, said the surgeon. What makes you say that? Asked the field marshal. Well, replied the surgeon, when woman was created, she was made from one of Adam's ribs. And surely only a surgeon would do something like that. Nonsense, snorted the field marshal. Even before Adam and Eve, there was a world, and it is said order was created out of chaos. Who else could do that but a soldier of the highest rank? <laughs> ah, said the politician. But who do you think created the chaos in the first place? <laughs> Is to, it is to Africa's politicians that we must look for <laughs> the sorting of our land degradation and climate change chaos. Thank you for your attention.